name is Reed Welch, and I'm going to introduce you to the Stout Theremin. And this is the Stout Theremin. This is a handmade vacuum tube theremin, originally built in 1937 by a fellow named Philip Stout. It came to me about a year ago, and I immediately took it apart to learn what made it tick. And soon I learned that it, it never ticked very well in the first place. So I became uh, Philip Stout's research assistant, and I'm carrying on the work that he began exactly 60 years ago. And after a lot of redesign work, this instrument's finally beginning to reach its full potential. What I wanted was to have a theremin that sounded as good as Clara Rockmore's theremin, and uh, I think I have it now. So, uh, just a quick sound sample, and I'll talk about how it produces the tones that you hear. Oh, this is the volume antenna, of course. I made this. This is a copper loop. I made it. It's sort of uh, reminiscent of what Lev, Lev Sergeyevich was doing in the 1920s. For me, as a left-handed player, having to stand on the wrong side of the instrument, a round loop is handy for me because I can, I can reach it as well as a right-handed person can. But a vacuum tube theremin has a sound that you don't get from a transistor theremin. I don't know why transistor theremins can't be made to sound like this, but apparently they cannot. collection of wire and capacitors and old vacuum tubes. It's more than the sum of its parts. In fact, uh, so is a violin of more than just the sum of its parts. Otherwise, it's not a great violin. So my goal was to make a great sounding theremin. Leon Theremin left the United States in 1938, and with him left the secrets to making this kind of theremin sound. So with no one else doing it, Myself and Dave Ball decided we had to recreate this sound. We have to make this kind of instrument available again today. Uh, so it, it's it's uh, a marriage also of the loudspeaker. The speaker is integral with the instrument. This this loudspeaker mechanism. This is a stand, a reproduction of Leon Theremin's own design. This one's newly made, but it's made just like the old ones. And it carries an old-fashioned speaker driver, a 15-inch speaker from the 1940s. And I'm going to rotate it so you can get an idea of what it looks like. I'll show you the back side. It's a little bit heavy. It comes around. There we go. Okay, so here it is. This is a loudspeaker from the 1940s. And this huge black thing here is the magnet. That's an Alnico magnet. It's extremely powerful. And what that means is that this loudspeaker gets very, very loud with very little power. In fact, this theremin is certainly powerful enough to fill in fill up uh, any concert hall with sound, and yet it produces less than two watts of audio output. Today's uh, electronic environment, we're used to using amplifiers with hundreds of watts and great big banks of speakers, but this is a musical instrument. We don't need to use force, we need to use finesse, and that's what it's all about. In fact, if I hook this theremin up to some other loudspeaker, it may not sound so good. I would have to uh, readjust the electronic settings to get it to, to produce a musical tone again. But it is matched to this particular speaker at the moment. There we go. So, uh, this is a theremin chassis. This is Philip Stout's work, and some of mine too, but most of the visual stuff is his work. This is his coil. This is my coil. Uh, output transformer, capacitors, and various tubes and transformers. Down below is another chassis with a big power transformer and a rectifier tube and some wires to interconnect the two chassis. All right, so briefly, here's how the theremin produces its tone and, and the control of the tone. It starts with two high-frequency waves, which are generated by these two tubes right here. High-frequency sine waves. Well, we couldn't hear them because they're about 200 kilohertz. So they are mixed together inside this little blue tube here called a Wonderlic dual grid triode. 
and it makes an it subtracts the difference between the two frequencies which are slightly slightly off pitch with each other and that makes the audio uh, note that you hear and that audio note is actually controlled by the hand's proximity to the pitch rod the pitch rod is connected to the pitch resonant coil inside this blue glass uh, covering here are two coils which resonate at 212 kilohertz so at that point of maximum resonance there's the greatest pitch change that's when your hand is close to the antenna so it produces the highest note so from there the audio note is amplified by this little black tube here fed through an audio transformer and then sent to the next tube for further amplification of course in all of these tubes the, 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 the audio wave is shaped and modified to give it the distinctive theremin tone quality in fact it's difficult to adjust the theremin so it has both the good quality and the treble the mid-range and the bass at the same time and then the, from this tube here the two power tubes which work in what's called push-pull and then the transformer for matching the tube's output to the loudspeaker over there this large coil is part of another circuit called the volume control circuit because it's one thing to have a sound but you have to be able to control the loudness of it from a whisper to a roar so this is also a pitch uh, a volume resonant coil this is a resonant coil just like this is it happens to be a very large one it's a high efficiency coil and it is connected to the large volume loop outside the cabinet so when the hand is, approaches this it, it, it upsets the resonance point of this coil and in doing so it, it allows uh, more audio frequency volume to pass to, to the amplifier section of, of, the, of the chassis here, these power tubes for instance. Uh, all of these things are adjustable, in fact there are many little settings here, mysterious looking dials that aren't mysterious to me but I think they will be mysterious if I die and don't write down their purpose. These two here control tone color. This controls pitch linearity and the pitch color in the bass is affected by this. This is a rough tuning control and this is a tuning control for volume sensitivity. So if one wants to get a big effect with a small movement of the volume hand, you, you would turn this knob slightly. Okay, you see the, the, the empty cabinet now, I've just removed the chassis. What remains is the power supply portion on, the, on a separate chassis and the loose wires. And over here on the table is the chassis. You're looking at the other side, you see the control panel, you see the transformers, and you see some of the tubes. Uh, I wanted to show you the underside of the chassis. Before I do that, I'll show you. This is the underside of the chassis as it was originally. It is, as Philip Stout left it in 1937. Uh, it's, it's quite complicated looking. It, it isn't really. But I tried this design. I, re, I rewired it only after finding out that this design did not give me the theremin tone that I wanted. And I think Philip would agree. He would say, redo what it takes to make it sound right. So I'll tilt it up. I'll tilt up the chassis so you can see what it looks like today. Now, if we built something like this today from scratch, it wouldn't look at all like this. Because parts today are different. Your wiring is different and resistors and capacitors look different. But this is 1937, so I worked with the lexicon of parts available to a 1937 builder. I used cloth covered wire and uh, antique. These are actual genuine resistors from the early 1930s. They're all in pretty colors. I think they're rather attractive. But the heart of the tone that I'm getting now is from these special coils, which I made. These are duplicates of Leon Theremin's design, and these are apparently key to getting an authentic vacuum tube theremin sound. The various parts are interconnected by wires, of course. These are the bottom side of the, of the various tube sockets, and there are filters and chokes and adjustments and little doodads here and there, and the harmonic controls on the front panel all wired into the circuit this way with you know, these anti-capacitors and resistors.